by the late 1970s, the Mexican gray wolf called the lobo were believed to be completely gone from the wild in the United States. Under the Endangered Species Act, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, together with the Mexican government, began efforts to save the lobo from extinction. A new era dawned for the Mexican wolf when one female and four males were captured alive in the Sierra Madre Mountains of Mexico, the last five lobos known to roam in the wild. The captive breeding program was then established, saving the lobo at the very last moment. For the first time in almost 30 years, the mountains were greeted by the howl of the wolf. Mexican gray wolf, the mysterious and the magnificent. I am a keystone species that keeps nature's beauty in perfect harmony. I speak for all wolves, as we have a deep and inherent communication with nature and all its inhabitants. At night, our spirits sing, soaring with the winds above the mountains and the trees. When we sing, our songs can be heard across lakes and throughout forests. In the mountain meadows surrounded by granite guardians and green forests, we live as our ancestors have done for thousands of years. This is our home, our songs, and our land. It's still the law to recover species teetering on the brink of extinction. And in this case, you've got the rarest and most critically endangered land mammal in North America. Completely eradicated from the United States and redu reduced to a handful in Mexico that were live captured and pulled from the wild. You can't get closer to extinction, to forcing an animal off this planet than reducing it to one female left on the landscape. And that's the story of Mexican wolves. most significant problems facing this program has been the inability to release genetically valuable animals. That's a problem for Mexican wolves because of the limited gene pool and the need to get full representation of the lineages back into the wild to reduce the effects of genetic inbreeding. Without having resilient populations of sufficient size and genetic integrity, an isolated population of, of low numbers could be wiped out in a matter of years. 
I think those lessons learned in the earlier years of the program were extremely valuable, but they were hard-won lessons. You know, it resulted in the loss of genetically valuable and in some cases irreplaceable animals. The knowledge that is available now, I think, are sufficient to put this program back on track and help these animals find their way back into the landscape in a way that ensures they'll be here for a long time. For many thousands of years, Mexican wolves roamed the Southwest, as well as, of course, adjoining Mexico. In the 19th century, Western settlers brought their cattle on the open range, and at the same time, our pioneering society was gunning down the animals that the wolves relied on. And their populations crashed. So naturally, the wolves preyed on the livestock. And what the livestock owners did is they organized for state-sponsored bounty. The last wild wolf was killed in southern Colorado, near the border with New Mexico. When the Endangered Species Act became a law at the end of 1973, the Fish and Wildlife Service knew that they were very close to losing the Mexican wolf to extinction, which had been their long-standing goal with this new law they had new marching orders, which is to save this animal from extinction. And they sent down one of their experienced wolf trappers in the Sierra Madres of Mexico. Between 1977 and 1980, he was only able to capture six wolves. One of these animals died in his trap. Of the remaining five wolves, four of them were male, and only one of them was female. She was given the name Nina by her handlers. They did manage to get that female pregnant, and all of the Mexican wolves that we know of in the world today stem from that last female, plus two other pairs of wolves that had been captured separately and were later interbred with those last three wolves. Every single Mexican wolf that we know of today stems from those last seven survivors. Wolves have families just as human beings have families. There is alpha male and alpha female, which are the, typically the, the two parents in the pack. Uh, they, of course, have pups. <laughs> Oftentimes, the pups who have been around for a year and are halfway to adulthood will stick around with the family even as new pups are born. But as, as the family grows, uh, eventually, uh, the younger wolves will set out on their own and try and find a mate and establish a, a family of their own. Wolf recovery was a new frontier when the department decided to move forward in a leadership role, balancing the needs and interests of hunters and livestock producers and landowners as well as conservationists. The Mexican wolf is listed under the Endangered Species Act as non-essential experimental, allowing greater management flexibility. I've been involved in the recovery of the Mexican wolf now for 24 years. And I ran the program that resulted in wolves being reintroduced into this area back in the 1990s, was the beginning of it. It's still going on today. It's a boy. We have many partners in the uh, Mexican Wolf Recovery Program. We're working closely with the Arizona Game and Fish Department, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Wildlife Services, Forest Service, 
32 zoos or wildlife breeding centers uh, all throughout the United States and in Mexico, raising Mexican wolves for us in captivity. The wolves are just about gone. Right mm -hmm. Non-government organizations have uh, provided support in various ways. And the initial recovery plan was a joint U.S.-Mexico recovery plan. In March of 1998, 11 pioneers of the rarest and most unique species of gray wolf in the United States were released into the Blue Range Wolf Recovery Area in Arizona, beginning their historic journey, the journey to recovery. We are directed by the Endangered Species Act to recover endangered populations. The field team is responsible for monitoring the wild wolf population um, on the ground. My specific team is involved with monitoring the wolves in Arizona. We have several alpha animals that are breeding right now, and we don't know their genetic background know they're pure Mexican wolves because their offspring we've been able to catch and test. But since the population was bottlenecked so bad, genetics is very important to uh, know. Alpha animals that continually inhabit one territory, colors that need to be replaced, those are the animals we like to get. We're gonna go and try and capture the female that's with uh, the male in the Elkhorn pack right now. She needs a, a collar replacement. the color that was easy to see I'm gonna do a temp real quick 104.4 all right that's a good temperature I'll I'll put it up over your head okay all right got it all right head down, down helicopters this way Go to the helicopter and go around the front. We have hands on them just to make sure that they're breathing okay, to show or to check and see if their temperature is stable. Four 
halfway across. One, one dart. She didn't get a full dose, a lot of head movement. Yeah, you can just set it down. She's hey, Jeff, where was the dart? It bounced off of her back. I mean, every time we handle a, a different wolf, it's a unique experience. Yeah. They're all very different behaviorally, and you can tell, you know, some of them apart. Yeah. Okay. Um, just by their looks. Okay. That's a pretty minor one. It looks pretty good. We try to uh, maintain uh, active functioning radio collars um, on the two alphas at minimum within a given pack but we do like to also collar uh, yearlings and pups of the year so that we can document dispersal and new pack formations. Uh, one of the drugs I gave her is reversible. Not a lot of wear. Not a lot of wear at all. Mild tartar, yeah. mild wear. Currently, every wolf on the landscape is wild born. Having pups every year is a good sign of this ecosystem being able to sustain them. The effects of the darts that we use on the wolves will last between three and four hours, but they'll start waking up after an hour. But we'll hold them a little longer until they're fully awake uh, before we release them back into the forest. These wolves are really particular on what they what they take, you know. Every time I've been on a wolf kill, most of them I've found were old and teeth are worn down clear to the gums, you know. And I really investigate. I uh, do a little necropsy on the animals. Wolves can, you know, pick and choose by testing animals. If they come across an animal that's lame or diseased, you know, they can smell it, they can see it. We just heard from uh, the Arizona field team leader, uh, Jeff Dolphin, and he's located the blue stem pack. Currently, we believe there's uh, up to 10 animals. Uh, that includes uh, alpha male and female, um, some yearlings, and then also uh, pups of the year. Now, this pack of wolves being this far north is unusual, so we kind of don't know what's going on, if it's a territorial kind of dispute thing or if they're actually pushing in and trying to take over. So it appears that we're hearing five of the seven uh, radio collared animals in this pack. There's some bald eagles here, so I wonder if there's something dead up here. elk tracks here. There's lots of wolf tracks here going both ways up and down the road. Looks like it could be our wolves. So there appears to be a, a nice blood trail, uh, highly suggesting that uh, they recently made a kill. Is maybe, maybe they are trying to get an elk. We're gonna go see if we can find it. You see the broken branches through here? This animal is just being chased through here. What happened is they were down in here as we approach, they're moving away from us, okay. um, which is typically what happens um, when you're trying to get close to wolves. Scavengers such as eagles, foxes, ravens, vultures and bears thrive on the remains of a wolf kill. The riparian areas in the southwest are absolutely critical. They're where uh, upwards of 90% of wildlife can be found. Wolves play a critical role in regulating the animals that eat the vegetation. So when you have wolves removed from a system, their natural prey becomes much more abundant. The elk like to sit around in our rivers and defecating in the river and graze the vegetation down to almost nothing. When the wolves are present, they chase those undulates and they keep them out of the rivers. 
And what that does is it allows the river vegetation to rebound and recover. It also is beneficial for the fish that need the vegetation to shade the river and keep the stream cool. That just has a cascading effect down the system for animals that require that vegetation. Well, Mexican wolves are part of this wild landscape that we're in. They, they evolved in an arid area. Uh, they're smaller than other gray wolves. They're crucial to the balance of nature. They're part of the reason that the deer are so alert, that the, the uh, bighorn sheep can, can leap so gracefully from cliff face to cliff face without falling to their death. So the wolves and other carnivorous animals culled the ones that weren't so fitted to their, their ecosystem and didn't allow them to pass on their genes. So we can credit the wolf with a lot of the beauty that we see in this area today. wilderness and it's one of the most beautiful and spectacular landscapes anywhere. It's also very sacred to my two sons and I as this is where we take our annual backpacking trip and it's really as good as it gets in terms of fatherhood. Right now we're just walking back down this trail to see if we can find any wolf tracks. Well, that's a big wolf track. <laughs> that's a very large wolf track. Um, but remember the difference between cats, cats and dogs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, what's the difference? Um, with a wolf track, you can draw an X across the toes over the, the big pad right here. Draw an X across here and here. But with a jaguar track, it's more of a track like a three and then a paw. Well, it's not surprising we're finding so many bones and tracks in this area. We've got a side drainage off here to the east and like another drainage just off to the west. So this is kind of a confluence of activity for critters moving across the landscape from wolves to mountain lions and bears. And who could blame them, you know? It's not a finer place in the west. Well, because of the scats and, and bones and tracks, I think uh, this would be a good place to set up a few of the motion sensor cameras to get a better idea of what's happening here. So I'll probably come back down with the boys later this week and do a little camera trapping. The need for close monitoring of wolf behavior really isn't there as it was at the beginning of the program. A lot has been learned about how they establish territories and utilize the habitat. Our strong preference is to place greater emphasis on non-invasive monitoring techniques such as the use of motion sensor cameras. A great form of monitoring that can help guide wildlife management and help livestock producers take precautions to reduce conflicts between wolves and livestock. Well, it takes pictures if something moves this way. All right, so this is more like a black bear than a Mexican wolf. All the Mexican wolves we have today came from a breeding founding population of only seven animals. Seven animals, that, that's like within a wink of becoming extinct. There were three females and four males and three different breeding lines uh, involved. One of those lines we call the McBride lineage. That was the only certified lineage of Mexican wolves because they had a known origin from the wild. That population was just had three founders, one female and two males, and we considered that the genetics of that population to be so bottlenecked that we were looking for 
ways to improve that. Well, it had long been known that there were other Mexican wolves in captivity. There was a line called the Ghost Ranch line that came from the last male wolf captured alive in the United States in 1959 in Southern Arizona. Paired with a female that was purchased by a tourist in Mexico and transported across the border in the saddlebag of a motorcycle in 1960. Some folks in Mexico had taken these pups from a wild den and sold them, and he bought one. So he gave it to the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum in Tucson. They had that male from 1959 in captivity. So eventually that female matured and those two bred and that became what's called the Ghost Ranch line. There was another line of wolves that was known to exist in the Aragon Zoo in Mexico City. They were called the Aragon line. So in the mid 1990s, I asked a group of canine geneticists to evaluate the genetics of animals to determine their purity, and discovered that the uh, Ghost Ranch and Aragon wolves were actually pure Mexican wolves. Based on that information, then we asked the captive breeders to start merging those lines to give us more gene diversity. That was our first boost in solving this problem of uh, a very limited base of genetic uh, diversity. So when you're getting ready to do a reintroduction project, you don't want to release wolves that are uh, habituated to people. So we built a couple pre-release facilities that are, there are two that are managed by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, the Ladder Ranch is one of them, which is where we are today. And uh, we brought the animals in to, to kind of retain their wildness as best as possible by reducing the amount of human exposure they receive. A lot goes into getting an animal into the wild population, several years per animal. Uh, Pre-release facilities are uh, like a halfway house between the wild and captivity. We keep uh, wolves that are slated for uh, being released in the wild, or uh, we also have some wolves that needed to be removed from the wild. Currently, we have six wolves. The two wolves that are in this particular pen are named the Coronado Pack. These two wolves show very typical behavior uh, of a wolf that we consider uh, behaviorally adequate for release. Uh, they will stay away from us as much as they can and either hide or try and run. A couple years back, my dad Aaron and I were out um, camping along the Black River and out in this little um, field, we saw a juvenile Mexican gray wolf and he was just out there really joyful and just running around the field and just amazing to see. Yeah. A week or so later, we found out that that wolf had been shot and killed and it was devastating, particularly for my kids. After having that personal connection with the wolves, it was a sense of loss, you know, it was a loss for all of us. Mexican wolves are facing a very significant challenge in that they have very real genetic crisis. There are only three genetic lineages remaining, McBride, Aragon, and Ghost Ranch. At present, the McBride lineage is significantly overrepresented in the wild. It's imperative to, to recreate as much genetic diversity as possible. And the degree of diversity that's necessary to ensure a future for these Mexican wolves cannot be achieved in captivity alone.
When reintroductions first began in 1998, you know, we didn't know if they would be successful or not. So we looked at the captive breeding population and we took the most uh, redundant or overrepresented animals from that population and release them to the wild because it wouldn't be a loss to the captive breeding program if those animals didn't survive. To solve the problem of overrepresentation of the McBride lineage DNA, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has begun cross fostering pups in the wild. Young pups with different DNA lineage are removed from captive-born litters and relocated into a den in the wild with a litter of similar age. Since they will be raised by their wild family, they will have a greater natural fear of humans. When the pups are grown, they will form new packs, mixing their DNA with the wild population. However, cross-fostering is a timely process and not all the pups survive. It is far more beneficial to release a genetically suitable breeding pair directly into the wild. Animals like wolves, they require large areas for their populations and then we need large areas to support those. So one of the concepts that we talk about in restoring nature is the need for wildlife corridors. What we mean by corridors are broad swaths of suitable wildlife habitat that allow animals that require large areas to move between one large block of habitat to another. So the area behind me, for example, is thousands of acres. I would expect this area to support maybe two or three packs of wolves, and that's a very small start toward a ecologically and uh, biologically vi viable population of wolves. In other words, a population that small would be very uh, extremely susceptible to extinction at any given time. been proposed by a group of scientists that we need to establish at least two more populations of Mexican wolves to the north. One would be in the Grand Canyon region. If one population gets low or even goes extinct, wolves, wolves can move uh, through these corridors and repopulate uh, those areas that became, say, temporarily extinct. From up top of the mountains here, you can get a good overview of all of wolf country, from the Paradise and Hawk's Nest pack territories, down south to Blue Stem and Rim, and then over to the Maverick pack territories. You can get a 360 degree view of you know, the world we live in, and the center of my world. You know, this is where most of our work occurs. And in that pack territory this year, we have three current coexistence programs with ranchers that reduce conflicts between wolves and cattle particularly. Our principal mission in the Southwest is focused on wolf restoration and the ecological restoration that accompanies wolf recovery. You know, Hawk's Nest Pack had previously denned up over here in that cliff above the drainage in what is arguably one of the most beautiful places in western North America. So clearly wolves move up and down through this drainage which illustrates why it's so important to have a range rider. And we've been wor working with having a range rider for about eight years. Honestly, it's been a good program for us. Craig has always contacted me and tried to help me in any way he could. All of us have worked really hard to work together with the wolf people and us as a team. The range riding definitely helped. They check a lot of times where the wolf packs are. The man that works for me here, he's seen a wolf, I think, once in eight years, and I've seen a wolf once in eight years. So we're 
we're heading down to the Sevieta Wolf Management Facility on the Sevieta National Wildlife Refuge. It's around an hour and a half south of Albuquerque. We're going to capture a female wolf and do a quick physical exam, vaccinations, dewormer, and crate her and transport her to the Ladder Ranch Wolf Management Facility. We're shuffling wolves around a little bit to make room for some incoming animals. And this wolf we're handling today is an older wolf. She's over 10 and she was in the wild. We visit the facility as infrequently as possible, once or twice a week to feed and check waters. So my students and I have been coming here for about five or six years and have helped to prepare several wolves to be moved into the wild. I think for me as a teacher, the opportunity to connect uh, students to real life experiences. This is the opportunity to see and do something that has real meaning. The uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, allowing volunteer high school students to participate in a program like this where they learn uh, how to safely enter a facility, how to work side by side with professionals. And we have several of our students who've done this over the years who have now gone on to college and studied wildlife and are now working in the conservation field. So our tradition every time we come down to Sivieta is to always read from the Sound County Almanac and to read the essay Thinking Like a Mountain by Aldo Leopold. We reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then, and I have known ever since, that there was something new to me in those eyes, something known only to her and to the mountain. I was young then and full of trigger itch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer that no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. In two, the year 2000, the first group of wolves were in, reintroduced into the Gila wilderness just off the left flank and a little behind Lily Mountain. And we started by going to our facility at the Sevieta National Wildlife Refuge. We captured the wolves in their pens there and hauled them down here to the southern edge of the Gila wilderness. We packed them up, rode about 16 miles into the middle of the wilderness it's on the backs of mules and put the uh, wolves in a pen that was built on top of a hill. Our crew had built the pen made out of nylon mesh so that the wolves could actually chew their own way out. I was sitting in my camp that first night watching the sun go down and as it got almost dark, all of a sudden, a howl erupted off the hillside right beside my camp. Guess the wolves were probably 50 yards away. As I was watching in the direction of the howl, I saw this just in the last bit of light, a gray shape moving across the land out about 50 yards from my camp. I knew at that moment that the wolves had chewed their way out, and for the, now for the first time in probably 50 years, there were wild wolves again roaming in the Wahila wilderness. And it was a real special experience for me to be the person there to witness that. And we're preparing to take a group of eco-tourists on a trip into the Gila wilderness. And we're here on the theme of wolves. A new group of wolves was released here about 12 miles or so within the last few weeks. Well, the way this trip works is that we hire packers who come in with a string of horses and mules and they pack all of the heavy stuff. They set up a camp in a beautiful meadow right next to the middle fork of the Gila River.
We camp there for three nights. We'll have meals together. We'll go out on day hikes to various places. We'll be talking about a lot of things on this trip that relate to wolves and the restoration of wild nature to the importance of wild habitat. And our greatest hope is to either see a wolf, which is a pretty rare opportunity, but we might well hear wolves at night in our camp. That's good, thank you. What this trip represents is the early beginnings of ecotourism in this region based on the presence of the wolf. And the more wolves that we can put in this area, the better the opportunity would be for ecotourists. Wolves are an odd critter. People either love them or they hate them, but there's a whole lot more people that love them than don't. And uh, they uh, are interested in coming out now that we have wolves in the area to experience that. Oh, yesterday was quite nice. We had a, a hike through a beautiful meadow. We observed a small pup. You know, the energy level, you know, just elevated tenfold, and people were scrambling to get their cameras and binoculars out of their pack. And, you know. and the experience of hearing a wolf howl in the night in the wild is I just have a sense that the that the world is right, that the ecosystem is intact, that all is right, you know, with nature. Sitting on top of this western sky Is it gonna be the one to take me far and wide? With you Cause I believe that all these words that we're saying They're making a path that will show us a way I've been away But I can feel it in my bones This time I'm really coming 